Hello, and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Martha Booker Johnson, and I am the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation, or ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. Today's speakers are Helen Eaton and Lizzie Poole. Helen is a senior linguistics consultant with SIL International in Mbeya, Tanzania. She has worked on Sandawe and many Bantu languages of southwestern Tanzania. Her research interests include Sandawe, particularly grammar and discourse, Bantu languages, discourse, tense aspect mood, and orthography. Lizzie is a linguist working with SIL International in Tanzania with the Mbugwe and Rangi languages. She works primarily on documentation and description of these languages, especially to support orthography development. Her MA was on Mbugwe phonology with a particular focus on consonant clusters and vowel hiatus resolution. Please join me in welcoming Helen and Lizzie as they give their talk, Mother Tongue Literacy in the Rift Valley, Past Experiences and Present Day Work with the Mbugwe Community. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we really appreciate this opportunity to talk a little bit about mother tongue literacy work in the Rift Valley. SIL has been involved there for more than 20 years now. Um, we've been doing this work in cooperation with the language communities. And we should stay, say at the start that neither of us is a literacy specialist, as you probably know, we're linguists with SIL, but we've been involved to varying extents with literacy work together with colleagues. My experience is mainly with the Sandawe and mainly in the past, and Lizzie's is with the Mbugwe and in the present. I'm gonna start by briefly explaining the place of literacy in SIL's work and then reviewing what's happened um, in terms of literacy in the Rift Valley area since SIL began work in Tanzania. Lizzie will then take over and she's gonna use the majority of our time to talk about a literacy workshop she organized for Mbugwe speakers last year. She's going to talk about the goals for this workshop, how it was put together, what the successes and challenges were. And she'll also talk a bit about the future plans for the work with the Mbugwe. And then I'm going to come back at the end um, just with a few thoughts on how SL's literacy work has changed over the years and the direction in which we seem to be heading. We're not going to talk specifically about orthography development, though, of course, that's a prerequisite for literacy work. So if you are interested in that, Lizzie and I gave a talk on that in 2021 in this series. So that's available on the YouTube channel. So let's start by looking at literacy and SIL. Liter um, SIL describes itself in the following way. We're a global faith-based nonprofit that works with local communities around the world to develop language solutions that expand possibilities for a better life. SIL's core contribution areas are scripture translation, literacy, education, development, linguistic research, and language tools. I think literacy is probably one of the areas which people don't immediately think of when they hear the name SIL. If they've heard of SIL, it's probably in connection to Bible translation, um, or it may be in connection to linguistic research, or perhaps our language tools like um, IPA fonts or software like Flex. However, literacy is one of the areas where we work, and depending on the country and the context, it can be quite a, a big part of the overall work. If you are interested in reading uh, more about how literacy improves life, I really recommend this link. Um, there's some great stories about how people have benefited from mother tongue literacy, such as by gaining access to better Sorry. medical care and um, being able to improve record keeping in their business and things like that. So in Tanzania, as many of us know, um, primary school education is mainly in Swahili. There are some private schools um, which offer English medium education though. Secondary school though is in English. So there really is no mother tongue medium education unless you are someone who speaks mother tongue Swahili or English. So that means in the Tanzanian context, our literacy focus as SIL has been on transition literacy rather than basic literacy. So that is with very limited exceptions, we've always been working with people who are already literate in Swahili, occasionally also in English, 
And therefore, learning to read in their mother tongue is a matter of a transition from literacy in one language to literacy in another language. Whereas in a basic literacy program, people, either adults or children, are taught to read from a starting point of having no literacy skills in any language. And in other parts of Tanzania, such as where I am here in Mbeya, we've been able to do trans transition literacy as part of a cluster approach where literacy workshops took place for groups of multiple Bantu languages with similar orthographies. And the Rift Valley is obviously very different in that respect. So literacy work there has always been tailored to specific languages, individual languages. In terms of language development, SIL began working on the following languages in the Rift Valley in the years shown. So of that list, it's um, only those in bold that have really had literacy work for any significant length of time. So that's Burungay, Sandawe, Rangi, and Abugwe. And each has been different in approach uh, according to the specific language context. Lizzie's going to share in detail about the Mbugwe literacy program shortly, which is the only one of the four currently continuing in any substantial way. Neither of us has experience with the literacy work in Burungay, but we've both had some interaction with those who are trained as Rangi literacy teachers in the early 2000s. And I've got some direct experience of the Sandawe literacy program from around the same time. So now I'd just like to highlight a few points where these earlier literacy programs differed from the approach now being taken from Bugwe. So firstly, in all cases, um, the initial orthography development was more a traditional approach with non-mother tongue linguists and other specialists coming up with the orthography by working with speakers rather than the participatory approach that we favor now. And if anyone is interested in hearing more about that particular approach, I can explain more after the presentation. The first literacy teachers tended to be non-mother tongue speakers um, who developed primers and teaching material first and then taught the orthography to a small group of mother tongue speakers in what we generally called a literacy class, like this one for Sandawe in 2004. The equivalent now we would call a literacy workshop or a writer's workshop. And I think the difference in terminology isn't trivial, it is significant because in the older approach, the emphasis was on the participants just receiving teaching rather than as being part of the development of the orthography or the development of the literacy material being used for teaching. So we'll see how the Mbugwe workshop, Lizzie will talk about, exemplifies that workshop approach rather than the class approach with the participants doing work and not just receiving teaching. The intention with the first literacy classes was then that this group of mother tongue speakers would be the first pool of literacy teachers to go out into the community and teach others. And in some cases, this only happened when funding was provided for the teachers, but some continued on a volunteer basis, even once the money ran out. Um, this was mainly done through church groups, obviously not through schools. Um, the amount of people reached that way varied a lot from language to language. Sandau is an example where literacy didn't take off at all, really. Um, audio and video recordings soon took over. Many more people attended Rangi literacy classes, though, and there were full-time SIL staff employed to support this and provide training for literacy teachers. I think the Sandawe situation is a good example of how SIL responded to the community's desires, which is something we do aim to do when we're planning our work. As much as I personally and others involved really wanted people to catch the vision for Sandawe literacy and get excited about it, when that didn't happen, the focus of the work shifted instead to audio and video media, which the community responded very well to and wanted more of. But I can end on a new hope, though, for Sandawe, because although the Bible translation continues in an oral approach, which results in audio recordings, some community members have been asking for written translation again. So we're hopefully going to be starting to help with that next year. So I think, in summary, our early literacy approaches were more outsider-led and less participatory with respect to the community compared to what we're trying to do more of now, which Lizzie will now tell us about. Thank you, Helen. Yeah, so I'd like to share with you the approach that we're taking for Mbugwe literacy. 
um, how the workshop we ran last year fits into this and what we currently see as our next steps. So Helen's already mentioned a talk we did in 2021 on orthography development and that, of course, orthography development is a prerequisite for literacy. You can't start any literacy teaching until you've got some form of orthography. However, orthography development is a process of trial and improvement, and it's only as people start using the orthography and as they learn to read and write that you find out whether it's working and where you need to make changes. So in the context of mother tongue literacy in the Rift Valley, orthography development and literacy go very much hand in hand. So sometimes some of the things that I mentioned will sound a bit more like orthography development um, and other times they'll be more clearly literacy activities, um, but they do feed into each other. So as Helen said, we're using a participatory approach from Bugwe because we believe this is the best way to end up with an orthography that will be used by the community. And before talking more about the writer's workshop that took place last year, I thought it would be good to place it in the context of work which has happened previously. So the first workshop was held in 2009 and focused very much on developing the alphabet. Um, whilst the linguists involved already had an idea that there were seven phonemic vowel qualities plus length, the workshop is structured in such a way as to allow the participants to discover this for themselves. Um, a report of this first workshop um, said the following. At first, all were convinced that there are only five vowels in Mbugwe. When we kept asking questions and presented some minimal pairs, someone commented that in pronunciation, those are two different vowels in Mbugwe, but in writing, it's just one vowel. Once they got the idea that it would actually be possible to write seven different vowels, they began to split the piles of O's and E's, and they sorted the vowels quite consistently into seven piles. So I think this illustrates how the participants' linguistic understanding of Mbugwe grew over the course of the week. And as a result, the idea of introducing extra symbols into the alphabet was much more acceptable than it might have been had the linguist just told people that it was necessary. Um, a second workshop was held in 2011, going into more depth, particularly looking at tonal issues in verbs and questions around word breaks. But then for the next few years, orthography development essentially took the form of translators trying to follow the rules agreed at the workshops um, and succeeding with some of them, but finding others too complicated. And so making their own adjustments um, as well as uh, identifying new issues that needed addressing. And so after the second workshop and until I arrived in 2016, the translators didn't have much linguistic input. And while that might have delayed progress somewhat, it was probably an excellent test of which orthography decisions made intuitive sense and should be kept and which needed more thinking about. So, for example, when I arrived, they were consistently using seven vowel graphemes and distinguishing short and long vowels and also marking second singular subjects to disambiguate them from third singular subjects. However, they found the other forms of tone marking difficult to apply consistently. And by this point as well, they were ready to start publishing some sections of the Bible, and so literacy teaching was needed. Now, part of the translation process involves reading what's translated with members of the community to get their input, but up until now, this had just involved the translators reading out loud for people to listen to and comment. Um, from here on, though, the translators began starting these checking sessions with a basic introduction to the Mbugwe orthography. And in 2018, they ran a more in-depth session of literacy teaching for those who are part of the language committee. All this um, teaching, though, was very ad hoc and informal. So between 2018 and 2020, we listened to feedback from those who had been taught. I did some more linguistic analysis and we identified some dialect issues that were causing problems um, with deciding how to spell certain sets of words. And we were finally able to do a dialect survey in April 2022 and make some orthography decisions based on the results. So I gave a talk in this series in 2023 about that. So again, that's available on the YouTube channel if you'd like to know more. But what this meant was that we were finally in a position to start more formal literacy work. And so in July 2023, I ran a writer's workshop. 
So writers workshops can have several different aims and they'll vary in what they cover depending on the exact goals um, in each case. Um, some suggestions for what the workshops might help with are given here. For the Mbugwe workshop, we were clearly going to be working with beginning writers rather than intermediate or advanced. And the main aim for us was essentially to kickstart literacy work in Mbugwe. But to do that, we needed to teach a small group of people how to read and write and identify potential Mbugwe literacy teachers. We also hoped that if there were any major issues left that needed addressing in the orthography, that they would be revealed as this group started to use it. And lastly, we hoped that we might produce a booklet of short stories in Mbugwe. I largely followed a model which is the culmination of the experience of many different people over a number of years. Um, I used this manual which was produced by SIL South Sudan and the Institute of Regional Languages in Southern Sudan. Um, and it's freely available to download and share. And um, there's a link at the end of the presentation. So the introductory workshop is designed to teach basic writing skills in five days, but it also assumes that participants can already read and write in their mother tongue. And this is one of those vicious circles of challenges we face with mother tongue literacy. To produce teaching materials, you need mother tongue writers, but how do you develop those writers without the materials to teach them? And so the solution we found was to run an adapted version of the writer's workshop, which included transition literacy teaching. One of the other things I did as well was to really emphasize um, that the people who were invited to the workshop should be competent readers and writers in Swahili. We didn't have a lot of time um, for people to get to grips with Mbugwe literacy, so the better their Swahili, Swahili literacy skills, the more quickly um, they should be able to pick up the differences in Mbugwe. And at this point as well, I should credit two Tanzanian interns who've been working with SIL Tanzania, um, Ombeni Mtanga and Pascal Warioba, for all that they did in contributing to the workshop. All the materials in the manual are in English, and it was Ombeni and Pascal who took on the formidable task of translating everything into Swahili. So this was our schedule for the week. Um, the details aren't particularly important, but what I'd like to show you is the various types of activities we did. So the sections in blue are the teaching specifically on reading and writing and Bugwe. Red is teaching on aspects of good writing more generally. Um, and the rest of the time, um, the things in black, is time the participants had to put into practice what they'd been learning. So let's look at what we covered in a little more detail. And I'll start with um, talking about how we approach the literacy teaching since that's the focus of this talk. So as we've mentioned, we very much focus on the differences between Swahili and Mbugwe, but I wanted to start by actually showing the opposite and show the participants how much they already knew about reading in Mbugwe because they could read in Swahili. I wanted to encourage them that learning to read in Mbugwe shouldn't be as difficult as they might be expecting. So the first thing we did in terms of getting people to start reading um, was actually part of a session that talked about the fact that reading is more than just associating a sound with a symbol and pronouncing it correctly. So I wrote these Spanish words um, that they would be able to pronounce based on their knowledge of Swahili. And they all very successfully said them out loud but of course, the point was that they weren't really reading because they didn't understand what was written. Um, we did the same thing with these Mbugwe words, which was, of course, a completely different experience. They can read Swahili, they can understand Mbugwe. So there are lots of words they can already read in Mbugwe without having to learn anything new at all. And then we went in the other direction, looking at what they could already write. So using syllables that only contained letters that were familiar from Swahili, they had to go at building as many Mbugwe words as they could. And I think this was possibly their favourite activity of the whole week. Um, and we ended up with um, a whole flip chart um, sheet covered in Mbugwe words that they had written. Of course, we did then need to move on to teaching some new things. So we introduced new vowel symbols, first of all, by contrasting them orally. Uh, we used a keyword for each sound and did a type of 
So um, we introduced new vowel symbols first by contrasting the sounds orally. And we used a keyword for each sound and did a same or different activity. And then once people had got used to the idea of there being more vowels in Mbugwe than Swahili, we introduced the written symbols. Um, we introduced the idea of long vowels by using minimal or near minimal pairs. And at this point, we repeated the word building activity, adding in syllables that included the new vowels um, and long vowels as well as short ones. On day two, we talked about consonant combinations and syllabic nasals, which are familiar from Swahili, um, but we just highlighted that there are more of them in Mbugwe than in Swahili. Um, and the new idea for day two was to contrast the palatal nasal and the palatalized alveolar nasal, um, again, using minimal or near minimal pairs. On day three, we focused on tone issues, mainly person marking on verbs. So to introduce the issue, I had the participants tell me how to write the words he said and you said. I'm sorry that this isn't a great quality picture because I zoomed in a long way to try and make sure the words are visible. Um, and it was also taken before I'd quite finished writing the second word. But a couple of seconds after the photo was taken, the spelling for you said looked identical to the first word he said. So we noted the problem that if we only had consonants and vowels, we couldn't tell the difference between the two words, even though it was clear when they said the words out loud. And so that led on to a discussion about using other kinds of symbols to make the two meanings clear. And I won't go into the details of that discussion, but this was the system that we finally agreed on to use the macron um, to indicate second person singular and an umlaut for second person plural. And so now these two words, um, which each could have three potential meanings without any form of tone marking, um, are now unambiguous when we use the person marking um, as indicated. So we also highlighted a few other tonal ambiguities that we wanted address to address, but had to say at that point that we only had a tentative pro proposal so far because we knew that there were more problems that needed resolving. Um, we explained what our current ideas were, um, but I hope to gather the group again in August to talk about our new suggestions, which are hopefully um, more systematic um, for the for the tone system in Mbugwe as a whole. Um, so um, then thinking about writing more generally, we had a series of sessions looking at aspects of good writing, but the workshop plan suggests first talking about why you might want to write at all. So we brainstormed why people might write and summarized all of the ideas as to communicate. And we thought about different ways in people in which people communicate, comparing oral and written communication, um, looking at advantages and disadvantages um, of each. And we really emphasized that we weren't saying that one is better than, than the other, particularly in some contexts, um, communication by speaking is much more helpful than by writing um, in a conversation or giving a speech, for example. But we also acknowledge that written communication has benefits and it would be really good if the Mbugwe community were able to take advantage of those if they wanted to. Um, whereas at the moment, they couldn't even if they wanted to. Um, so we then spent a little bit of time looking at how writers can make things easier for readers, which was really a mini introduction to the principles of orthography development, um, a lot of which Helen and I talked about in a previous um, talk in this series. But um, briefly, we talked about, um, we thought about using appropriate symbols for the particular language rather than just copying another language's alphabet. We talked about um, how putting spaces and making sure you put them in the right places helps people read more fluently. Um, we talked about how writing the way people speak when they speak slowly and carefully, um, rather than running words together. Um, and also how always writing the same word the same way makes it easier for readers to learn to recognize whole words rather than getting stuck with having to sound out syllables each time. 
And the other things we looked at in terms of good writing were to do with punctuation and paragraphing, how to make your writing interesting, what goes into a good story, um, and also things to do with how to revise and improve your writing um, and what to check when you're proofreading. And then the rest of the time, really, the participants just did various activities to practice. Um, so we started very gently just with writing words and we'll use what the group did to produce picture dictionaries on various topics. So here we had um, what we've started to put together, um, a picture dictionary for parts of the body and animals. Um, and then after the session on punctuation, the participants started writing in sentences. So we had already published an alphabet book, um, and this is the, an example of a page of that. Um, that just had one word for each letter and a very simple sentence saying this is a, and in this case, this is a knife and this is a fire. So we called this alphabet book one. Um, and the participants at the writers workshop last year used these same keywords to write sentences for alphabet book two. And after talking about descriptive writing, um, they went back to the sentences they had written and thought about how they could make them more interesting. And then this page, which will be part of Alphabet Book 2, shows some of the results of that activity. Um, and then we moved on to writing stories. Um, so first of all, the participants told their stories to each other orally uh, to make sure they had some ideas. Um, and they filled in a story planning chart, um, which asked them to think about how they would like to introduce their characters, the setting, etc. And then they started writing. And a total of two out of the five days was spent on working on the stories. So writing a first draft, then applying things we talked about in the sessions on good writing. And on the final morning, they split into groups and each group chose one of their stories to work on together for final editing. The interns and I typed up those, uh, there were three of them, those three stories into a booklet for each participant to take home. And we also photocopied the other stories so each person could have a copy of each one. And later this year, we plan to publish a version that's got all of the stories included. One final thing we did each day was to practice reading together. So we used some storybooks which we'd already published and read them out loud, um, first as a whole group, and then volunteers took turns reading a page individually. So what went well? Um, I think there were two particular encouragements that showed that the workshop had gone well. Firstly, I was really pleased that everybody volunteered to read out loud um, individually at least once. And um, as well as the initial word building with syllables activity, I think this reading time was probably one of the highlights as the participants realised that they really could read in a book way and um, in just such a short amount of time as well. And secondly, by the end of day four, every single person had written a story in Mbugwe. Um, To be honest, I was very sceptical when I was told by colleagues that they had people writing stories in just one week of literacy training, but they were right. Um, and the picture shows um, the, yeah, what the, what the participants came up with. Um, so we realised that writing will always be more difficult than reading and we don't expect everyone to suddenly start writing extensively in Mbugwe. But I think this week showed both them and us um, that it was possible and not as difficult as they expected to both read and write in Mbugwe. So what are our next steps? Um, I mentioned that one of the secondary aims of the workshop was to identify possible literacy teachers. And there were definitely some in the group who would be capable of that. So. What we need now is to produce teaching resources and train the potential teachers. And we actually made a start on that in May, um, just a couple of months ago, when I invited three of the writers workshop participants back to help draft a teaching primer. And over the course of two weeks, they put their new writing skills to work and wrote 23 stories to include in the primer as reading practice. So these pages show firstly, lesson one on the left, and then lesson 23 from our draft. Now, we've only printed three copies of the primer so far, one for each of the team who helped write it. Um, and I'm hoping that they're having a go at using it with friends and family and getting feedback to find out what works well and what we could improve. Um, 
we showed the three who helped with the primer the new tone orthography that we're proposing and they agreed it made sense and had a go at using it in what they wrote for the primer um but now we need to follow up with the rest of the writers workshop participants and hopefully get their approval of it um, and let them have a go practicing as well um we need to um then start training potential teachers um, and allow a bit of time for them to test the primer before we look at what changes might be needed um, and before we kind of set people going on um, teaching. We'd like to publish the various things produced during the writer's, writer's workshop so that people learning to read have more materials to practice with. Um, so that will be Alphabet Book 2, some picture dictionaries, and the short story collection. Um, after finishing the primer draft, we had an extra day. So the three who helped also worked on a book describing different aspects of Mbugwe life and culture. Um, so there are more materials in the pipeline as well. We'd also like to develop a writer's guide. So the primer presents the different tone marks just as and when they are needed um, for the stories. But it would be helpful to have everything in one place as a kind of reference for people to to look up more easily and I also think it would be a good idea to write um, or develop a teacher's guide to go along with the primer that can help teachers think about the different activities they could use in classes but that's probably looking a little further into the future as we work out together um, what might work best for the teachers and their students. So that's where we've got to so far with Mbugwe Literacy and a couple of thoughts for looking ahead. Um, and now I'll hand back to Helen to wrap things up. Thank you. So looking back over 20 years or so of mother tongue literacy efforts um, that SIL has been involved in, in the Rift Valley, I think there are some encouraging signs. Um, so one of them I think would be um, people's enthusiasm for mother tongue literacy. So the Mbugwe workshop is an example of that. Um, and there's even been renewed enthusiasm after we've had to stop um, for whatever reason. Um, for example, the Sandawi community wanting to carry on more now with literacy after quite a long break. Um, another encouraging sign I think is the more community based approach to literacy, which we're taking these days. Uh, it tends to mean that it's less dependent on outsiders, less dependent on money, and it's more sustainable. And this has also meant a greater uh, sense of community ownership um, of mother tongue literacy. So um, we another maybe another area is that we see uh, mother tongue literacy in social media. Um, even if the orthography used is not always the one that the communities have actually agreed on, the fact that people are using their languages to write is really encouraging. Um, but there are some challenges um, definitely remaining. Um, one is that transition literacy works well if people can already read and write well enough in another language, but often they can't. And then we definitely need a different approach and a lot more resources, a lot more time to help people if that's the case. Um, another challenge is that people learning to read their mother tongues soon run out of material to practice on unless they write it themselves. So building up a good library is important, but it does take time again and resources. And I think my general experience, not just the Rift Valley, but also here in Mbeya, is that mother tongue literacy really needs um, champions in the community who are enthusiastic and can spread the word and encourage others. And then a, another challenge is that some languages such as Sandawe and Burungay are just different enough from Swahili that literacy workshops are not the kind of workshops that Lizzie's described. They, they tend to take a lot longer to prepare, a lot longer to do, and they can be quite off-putting, um, which was one of the problems with the Sandawi. But I think as long as language communities are requesting help with literacy programs, then um, as SI, we will try to provide that and to help um, and hopefully do so in a way that leads to more and more local ownership and sustainability in the future. So thanks for listening. Um, these are the two previous uh, talks that we've mentioned. And then we've also got a couple of um, links for useful resources. So I mentioned 
um, participatory linguistics. And the one on the left there is a, a, a book of case studies about that approach. Um, and then the manual that uh, Lizzie mentioned, and she will put the links in the chat as we talk now um, so that you can access these if you're interested. So thanks again for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. We can now begin the question and answer section. The question and answer section will be open to voice questions as well as written questions. If you would like to ask a question, just raise your hand in the nonverbal controls present underneath the participant panel, and I will send you a request to unmute. If you prefer to ask a written question that is also still possible, you can do so using the Zoom chat module, and I will read out the question. Please remember that the webinars are recorded so that if you ask a question, this will be part of the recording and will be released on the YouTube channel. Yes, uh, thank you, Lizzie Helen. Uh, I have a number of questions. I won't uh, ask them all at once, but um, so I have to choose now. Um, okay, can you explain the, how, what, what the tone marking, uh, how that works? Uh, what, what, uh, yeah. Yeah. So um, we have gone away from an approach that's kind of to do with marking surface pitch. So the tone marks are not intended to mark um, pitch, either phonetic or phonemic. Um, they are intended to be taught as grammatical marks. Yeah. So people hopefully will start to associate the line with the meaning you singular um and the two dots with the meaning you plural um rather than having to think about where do they need to go up and down um hopefully they will they will understand the meaning of the word and then that will result in them pronouncing it correctly um, okay so they are really i mean just grammatical affixes that are distinguished there are morphemes that are great yeah um, but but what are the tones for me, for the second, for for you, singular and and you, plural object. Um, you know, I don't actually know off the top of my head, but essentially, um, so between second singular and third singular subjects, they could both be an O prefix, and one of them's high and one of them's low, which then affects. I can't remember which way round they are, um, but that affects, um, yeah, the rest of the word, um, and then that would be. The same for uh, first plural object and second singular object. One would be high, one would be low. Um, and then uh, third singular subject and second plural subject. Also, um, one's high and one's low. Um, but rather than thinking about high and low, we're just very much hoping that people will associate the line with the meaning second singular and and the dots with the meaning second plural um so it, it's only for those um uh morphemes that they would write uh, the whether that they would yes write tone. Yeah. yeah in terms of person marking we've got some other marks for other tonal ambiguities but for person that's the only the only ones they would have yeah mm, interesting yeah and they're happy with that yeah, I mean, the translators are very good at reading those correctly. They never stumble. They have obviously had a lot more practice than other people. Um, but yeah, we will we need to see how things go. But that seems to be working so far. And I know uh, it's an approach that other languages in, um, in Tanzania with SIL have been using and also in other parts of the world. Um, well, I guess mainly in Africa where the tone uh isn't stable um seems to be making sense for people yeah. to mark the grammatical categories rather than marking pitch um yeah yeah, yeah. No, i find it very sensible what kind of <laughs> mistakes do people make when they make mistakes in writing what does what is really difficult for them so for this group in kind of days one and two um long vowels seems to be more difficult often one of the things i've seen quite a lot is that instead of writing one of the new vowel symbols they will write a long vowel instead so there's something going on there with how they're associating those sounds um 
but yeah they only had four days so no, <laughs> I'm hoping no, that with no, some more no, practice we'll, so we'll get there um, but that seems to be one of the big challenges at the beginning yeah. um they had absolutely no issues with the new the palatalized alveolar nasal at all that was absolutely fine oh. I struggle to hear the difference I can say yeah. the difference when I make my tongue do it yeah. but I I can't even hear myself when I'm doing it um but they that they had no issues there at all they knew exactly which one they needed um <laughs> yeah I suspect one of the other things that's going to be difficult is marking relative clauses with a tone mark um because that's a that's a high level understanding thing you have to be reading and comprehending the entire sentence before you can get that it doesn't work just sounding out syllables so again you hope people will get used to it but it's not even something we can begin to test until we've got fairly fluent readers so we're a way off getting feedback on that yet um yeah i'll come back later yeah <laughs> I'm going to ask a very quick follow-up question. Um, are the is vowel length mostly contrastive in the language, or is it not very frequently contrastive? It's pretty frequently contrastive. Yeah, there's minimal pairs for all seven um, vowels, um, including at the ends of words, which is unusual, I think. Um, so yeah, it's definitely. Um, yeah, it's it's used a lot, and um, it's uh, not always contrastive um, before prenasalized consonants and after um, consonant glide syllab um, onsets. But sometimes it is contrastive there as well. There are words where you put a particular, particularly verbs, you put a stative, uh, kind of stative or a separative uh extension on and then what was what had been lengthened before a pre-nasalized consonant is now shortened again um or <laughs> it never gets lengthened in the first place i don't know how you would decide which whether it's lengthening and shortening or just not lengthening um but yeah um so that there's enough differences between those to need to write short and long and also to need to write long vowels as double letters before pre-nasalized consonants as well um yeah. Okay. Thank you. Simon? Just, sorry, can I just add one point onto that more generally, but not relating to Mbugwe? I think vowel length across um, the languages of Tanzania that we work with in SIL is always a big issue, mainly because it is contrastive in some environs, but then often we have long vowels that are shortened and short vowels that are lengthened, and then we have other things going on with morphology. So it's it's not as simple as Yes, there are short vowels and long vowels, phonemic, fine, let's write them. It, the more you get into it, the harder it gets. So I think, I'm not sure that any language has been exactly the same in how we've had to deal with it. And it is an area that people do struggle with generally, not just in Bugwe. Yes. Yep. Oh, yes. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, Helen and Lizzie, uh, for your nice presentation. Um, I'm just wondering um, how difficult uh, was uh, teaching the Bugwe to the non Swahili literates, and of course, on the other hand, to the Swahili literates because they have already uh, the Swahili orthograph. Um, but also, um, I'm happy that uh, you made some sort of um, engagement with the society. But I'm trying to see um, how progressive this project is, uh, if there is any connection with uh, institutions so that we space the Mbugwe um, in the communication. For example, if uh, you engage the churches and mosques so that these people could use this language. Um, I mean, Mbugwe can get a space uh, in the communication process. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll start with the kind of question about how difficult is it to teach? <laughs> um, because this group, I was very specific that we needed good Swahili readers and writers. Um, that, I mean, I'd, I didn't find it particularly difficult to teach. I don't know how difficult they found it to learn, but I think um, 
I think the fact that every single person had tried to write a story by the end and had had a story that somebody else could read what they had written, even if there were some edits needed. Um, and that everybody, actually even on day one, everybody was reading the storybooks um, that we had produced. I think those are positive signs. Um, yeah, so I kind of alluded to it a little, I guess it was more probably in the previous talk that we are very much starting off with, okay, here's the Swahili alphabet. We're gonna adapt the Swahili alphabet rather than come up with something totally new because we want to take advantage of what people already know and make it as easy as possible for them to transfer their skills from Swahili into Mbukwe. Um, Yeah, we haven't really tried, well, we haven't tried at all teaching anyone who doesn't have any literacy skills yet. Um, we'll see what happens. In terms of it taking off more widely, um, we do work um, with the churches, definitely, um, both in the translation aspects of our work and also um, most of the people who are invited, I think, had some kind of connection to their local church um, in this writer's workshop. Um, it's kind of, I guess it's a bit of a, like Helen was saying, we would love for the vision to take off and people to start reading and writing in Mbugwe, but it really is going to be dependent on them wanting to do it. <laughs> um, I think the signs are encouraging um, for the Mbugwe. They do seem very enthusiastic, but yeah, at some point we kind of have to say, well, we've given you all the tools that you need, go do it. And it will really be up to up to the people themselves um, how much they take advantage of what we have tried to, um, I was gonna say provide for them, that's the wrong word. What we've tried to help them develop, um, it's it's then up to them to to do with it what they will. And as Helen mentioned for Sandawe, that didn't take off, but actually maybe now 20 years later, it's going, it, it will again. So yeah, we'll see what happens. <laughs> um, I can't remember if there was another aspect of your question. No, okay. <laughs> I don't know if Helen's got anything to add to that. Just thought of one one example. So um, about the orthography, something like ng apostrophe in the Swahili orthography causes all sorts of problems for yeah. us because yeah. um, we'd love to be able to use the apostrophe in different ways. And sometimes we do, but that one is always awkward. NY is also awkward in Swahili because it looks like you've got a consonant followed by a glide rather than a palatal nasal. So we we feel like we inherit these symbols and we don't try to change them, even if that would actually simplify the orthography, um, yeah. because we know that Swahili is so strong and we don't want to be competing. We don't want to confuse people. There are some examples, though, where we're not using uh, the same symbols as Swahili in other languages. Sandal is one where actually ch is a click um is rather than sh. so it, it was just very difficult to get that systematically working without cheating so we had to use something from swahili for a different uh sound and actually in in languages in this area as well sometimes what's written with um a k for example is not aspirated but often people have no idea that they're reading it differently because it's if, if they're reading in Kinga, they'll they won't aspirate it. If they read the K in Swahili, they'll aspirate it. People are very, very able to do things like that. So it usually works out in the end. Andrew. Thanks, Martha. Um, thanks, uh, Helen and Lizzie, for uh the talk. Like super exciting to see kind of this, um, to see kind of like the knowledge of the uh language sort of put into uh, action, like mobilized in this way. It's really, it's really cool. Um, my question was, I got really excited when I saw this um, excerpt from uh, the report. I don't know how long ago it was, but from this, from this report on how this workshop went, is that like a normal practice with SIL, like to produce a report at the end of most or every workshop? Uh, yeah, I can answer that. It varies a lot. Okay, yeah. um, we we do some kind of internal reports um, quite often, um, but we don't always share them very widely. So sometimes they exist. If you're particularly interested in any language and you contact 
someone still involved, we might be able to find something, but we tend to only make things available the more academic side of our work. So survey reports would be written up, but works and, and published or at least made more available as manuscripts, but workshop reports um, much less so, even though I realize they do contain some very interesting um, historical information that people would be interested in. Sometimes though, one of the issues is that we um, they're they're old and we don't have records of permission for some of our some of the information in them. So we're slightly cautious about how how widely we can share them. But if you are interested in anything, just yeah, let us know. I think it would be so cool to write something based on 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 these reports, just to see like when they happened, how they happened, how they went down, things that went well, things that didn't. I just think there's a tremendous amount of learning, but yeah, also like as historical documents, there's so much there, but um, mm -hmm. points on why it, it's difficult to make them accessible, like well taken, yeah, for sure. I mean, that's, if that book at the end that we've got the link to really is, is case studies from all over the world. Um, so that would have a lot of exactly those things, what we did, what went well, what we won't, what we won't do next time. Um, sometimes the things that we've got from those workshops, they end up, in a slightly different type of uh, document. So we tend to write an orthography statement, which is kind of the final description of how um, how the community has agreed to write. And so there'll be things from early workshops that feed into that, um, but it won't, yeah, it wouldn't look, it wouldn't be exactly the workshop report, but it would contain that information. Yeah, okay. that's the idea anyway. <laughs> Hopefully that happens. Yeah. Um, I have a further question, uh, Helen. You finished by 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 saying that one of the encouraging things is is that we see people using written language on social media, and I'm wondering, has there been any interface between social media and the kind of orthography development that you guys are doing? Have you seen any sort of like, uh, have you seen any sort of like uptake on uh, on social media? Well, yeah, that's an area that. We've been paying more attention to in the last 10 years or so. So for some orthographies that were developed, say, before 10 years ago, it wasn't something that we were paying attention to for obvious reasons. So um, we, we do now have one of the aspects in sort of deciding on orthographies is involving a, a language technology consultant who will tell you don't use the symbol for a tone mark because if you type this you're going to suddenly mess things up like don't have an at sign for a tone mark because you'll be forever atting people in social media and it will drive you crazy so there you go you know something like that but as to then does now our the orthography is going to maybe change a bit to reflect that. That's something we're going to have to wait and see. One thing that I've talked to people in this area about is how there are languages, German's the only one I really know, but where you can have a um, two different orthographies, effectively. You can have an orthography that uses an umlaut and you can you can write a vowel and then a different vowel to, to get around that if you want to type on a keyboard that doesn't have it. So... I've talked to people here about that kind of issue. And I think if that really took off and someone came up with something on social media that, that worked really well, then we would certainly consider that. One of the big problems we have with vowels is the fact that we have short and long vowels. So we really want to avoid using digraphs because then if you double them, you get some very strange looking words. So it is just the feature of the languages that we that we struggle with solutions for any language with more than five vowels. And that seems to be one of the first things that goes when people type on um, on social media. Um, so it's something we're keeping an eye on. And certainly for languages that are now starting orthography development, we're actually starting on Nika, Sicella and Wanda in about two weeks time. Um, it's, it's more at the forefront now to start from the beginning with how is this going to work? Um, how is this going to work for typing? How is this going to work on phones? Uh, and not just thinking about how does this work, writing it by hand. Yeah. Are there any last questions? Oh, Martin. Um, I remember it's quite some time ago, but I saw Oliver Stegen's uh, collection on, uh, on Lanky Story. So I was really 
curious, uh, can Bukwe speakers, or do you know whether Bukwe speakers can read those stories written in Langi? Some can. Um, so, for example, when I was in Dodoma in, um, just in May, the Rangi New Testament books arrived and the three in Bugwe who were there were looking at it and having a go. And there are some differences in how we've how the communities have chosen to write. So the Rangi writes um, a bard I and a bard you for the degree two vowels and use the, the same Swahili symbols for degree three, whereas Mbugwe uses the same Swahili symbols for degree two and uses the IPA symbols for degree three. So that would definitely take some mental gymnastics. Um, they, they, they had a decent go at reading it, but a lot of the time, the vocabulary was different enough that they couldn't get it. I think the more I've been working with both, the more I'm realizing how different they are. Um, <laughs> they they do have a lot of similarities, it's true, but yeah. um, but there are a lot of really basic vocabulary differences that meant, um, I mean, even just to do is a totally different word. And so that made it very difficult. Um, I, yeah, if they if they speak some Rangi as well, if they know Rangi as a as a speaker, then I think they would probably be able to do pretty well. But um, again, that's a yeah whether yeah, yeah. The, I think the languages are too different for them to just be able to kind of pick it up and read it and understand unless they also speak both languages. Um, and then, then yeah. the other thing is then you you mentioned to have a kind of book where you can look up things on how to. How to write and how to read mm -hmm. from Bukwe, and um, I, I'm 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 so uh, happy with uh, the the living Hehe dictionary that uh, Simon and Marta are working on. Uh, so I wonder, uh, uh, would that would that not be nice to have something like that for Bukwe and an excellent tool to to check uh, how to write things. I'd love to have an Mbugwe dictionary one day, um, as ever funding is a, we haven't been specific, kind of specifically asked for one. There are dictionary projects happening with SIL Tanzania, not currently with Mbugwe. It would be great if that could happen one day. Um, yeah, um, I don't know if Helen's got anything to, <laughs> to say on that. We're, we're low, low resources, I think, for dictionaries. Yeah. Um, yeah, but but how how are you doing it, Simon and uh, Marta? We're graduate students doing it in our spare time. But it's a beautiful dictionary. I think yeah. a huge advantage has been working with three native speakers because they can just come up with examples and record things on the spot. And so it just makes it so much easier than if you had to, for example, upload recordings. That would take forever. Mm -hmm. But you could even do it without recordings. Uh, no, it's also possible. I've looked into some of the software that should make it easier for people to kind of almost crowdsource um, these kinds of things. The, the translator who is most keen on the idea of the dictionary is also the one who would struggle most with the technology side of it. <laughs> um, so... Yeah. Um, yeah. And we'll... who's that? Is that? Mzemufulu. Oh no, I don't know him. <laughs> um, but uh, this Martin uh, that I worked with, who is not in your team, I guess, but he's related to those people, and he studied a bit of linguistics. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to add that more generally across the country, we do we we do try to respond when people are interested in dictionaries. One of our issues is that a lot of our funding is tied to translation, to actual Bible translations. So there's a percentage um, that has to be going towards that, which means um, linguistics and literacy tend to be squeezed. So um, it is just a practical problem of time, sometimes people, money. But yeah, we, we have got some people who've done more dictionary work in other areas. Um, and we, we know that people are very much interested in them. But I think it's what I said about the community champions, that if we can find people who really want to do it themselves, then 
facilitating them is very possible, whereas running it ourselves is is not. So um, we're looking out for those people. If you ever come across them, then um, we'd love to hear about them. Yep, I'll tell you. Yep. Great. Thank you. Um, I think those are all of the questions and comments for today. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page, and entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley bibliography. I would like to thank Helen and Lizzie again for their presentation and everyone else for participating today. We'll be on summer break, but we hope to see you back for our next webinar on Wednesday, the 4th of September.